One of the biggest challenges I faced as a founder has been trying to answer the market sizing question for investors. Before we invest in an opportunity or explore it, it's important to answer a very simple question. How big is this market? Three metrics that are often used for sizing markets. Number of households, their annual spend, and the distribution of both households and spend. When it comes to answering these three specific questions, for the Pakistani market, there are some really interesting and useful data sets. The first one is the Pakistan Social Lifestyle Measurement Survey. Uh, the most recent edition of that survey is as at 2018-2019. The second is the State Bank Payment Systems Report. Uh, most recent report is as at 30th June 2023. And the last and the most important piece is the 2017 census. There is a 2023 census, but we only have summary results for that. The essence of what you see next is based on the data from these three sources. As a founder focused on urban markets, my primary interest is in urban households. The chart that you see in front of you presents a distribution of urban households by their annual consumption. The base at the bottom represents the distribution of consumption in US dollar equivalent term. The axis on the left represents the count of households in thousands. So for instance, the biggest segment comprises of about 3 million households and these are households that consume between $624 and $2,570 per year. The highest consuming household is roughly consuming about $70,000 a year and in our data set, this specific data set represents about 3,000 households. Between these two segments, lies the next largest segment of households, approximately 1.5 million households that spend between 1.2 to four and a half thousand dollars a year. Is there a way to present the same analysis in an easier and simpler to understand fashion? Here's a quick summary. The first column presents the count of number of households. Total number of households in the data set above is 5.8 million urban households. Second column, presents consumption buckets. So the lowest slice is about 63,000 rupees a year. The biggest slice is about 20 million rupees a year. The average across all segments and across all income buckets is about 611,000 rupees, roughly about 50,000 rupees per month. And the third and final column converts all of this data into an equivalent USD amount and the average consumption expressed in dollar terms is about 2000, just about $2,200. So 5.8 million households with an average annual spend in PKR of about 600,000 rupees or about $2,200. This is a numerical representation of the same data we saw earlier. As a founder who works in the FinTech and financial services space, is there a way to get more specific? Is there a better cut? Third attempt at the same data set. We are still looking at share of urban households by annual consumption, so that hasn't changed. The grid below still represents uh, consumption in dollar terms. But on the left hand side, what we've done is we, rather than looking at exact number of households, we're looking at share. What we're now doing is comparing the general urban household population to population that actively uses their mobile banking applications on their smartphones to do financial and banking transactions. And when you see that, you can clearly see that the under $624 bucket is not represented at all in the mobile banking population, simply because bank accounts are expensive, also because not everybody owns or has access to a smartphone. Typical mobile banking user has a smartphone, has a bank account that allows them to transact using that smartphone, are educated enough, informed enough to learn to use and operate and work with a smartphone, and have the confidence and the savviness to conduct and execute financial transactions on a smartphone. So with that definition, we see that the first segment, the first two segments are clearly not represented. But the surprise is the next segment. The next segment, which is under $1,200 or $1,300 a year in annual consumption, uh, is also underrepresented. The largest segment, which is about 51% of the general population, is underrepresented. And you can clearly see a skew 
when it comes to higher income buckets the higher income buckets have a much higher significantly higher representation compared to their representation in the general population is there a way to validate this data can we cross reference and cross tabulate against other sources to see if our analysis is on the money and maybe that can lead to some additional insights the answer to that question is yes we now move to state banks payment system report a quarterly and annually published report that tracks mobile banking users and their quarterly spend you see here is a trend of spending patterns all the way from 2017 to 30th june 2023 the green bars represent the count of mobile banking users so you can see that this trend went from about 3 million users in 2017 to over just over 16 million users in 2023 the quarterly spend in dollar terms in usd terms was about $300 $350 in 2017 and now today stands at about $1600 so there's clearly been a upswing in spending patterns over the last 6 years how does this reconcile with the number of households and this is where we run into a simple disconnect our average quarterly spend for a mobile banking user is about $1600 $1600 into 4 for the four quarters gives you roughly about $6400. As per the household data, the part of a population that earns more than $6500 is just over 4%, roughly about 650,000 households. So if you assume two or three accounts per household, this 653,000 turns into maybe about 2 million account holders but the state bank data shows us 16 million households how do we reconcile that difference how do we go from 16 million users to 2 million users one if you assume 2 to 3 accounts per household you no longer have 16 million unique accounts you are down to between 5 to 8 million accounts 2 million of those accounts are here 653000 households into 3 accounts per household gets you 2 million accounts But what about the other three? The other three, in our estimate, represents three million SME account holders who run small businesses but don't have a formal incorporated entity. So, as far as local banking system and state bank is concerned, while they appear as individual retail accounts, they're actually retail SME accounts. So, two million households, three million SME accounts. You are at the magic number of five million accounts in total. What is the point of this analysis? What does this mean for us as founders? The point, my friends, is 653,000 households that spend just under $7,000 a year. These 653,000 households with their three bank account each roughly representing 1.8 to 2 million customers for the banking industry in Pakistan is what we are all chasing after. How do you link this and quantify it as a business? Take the example of payments. Payments as a business, and let's be very, very clear about: we're not talking about cards, we're not talking about Visa, Master, Union Pay, or any other payment channel. We're simply talking about bank-to-bank, inter-bank payment transfers, payments that happen on the mobile banking application, payments that generate fees for the banks that own those mobile banking applications, own those customers. What are those customers worth? Our estimate, based on the SPP payment data. is that a typical mobile banking customer generates about $7 a year for its bank $7 a year 16 million customers while we have 5 million unique customers but those customers represent 16 million mobile banking accounts so 16 million accounts $7 a year gives you about 112 million dollars that's the total size of the payment market when it comes to payments on mobile banking application ignoring payments that happen using cards and interconnect standards as a founder this looks attractive till you factor in a very simple and basic fact this 112 million is actually not 112 million for the simple reason that the top 3 banks in this specific instance capture more than 
85% of all fees. The remaining 15% you have to fight it off with the other banks on this list and any other payment and settlement providers in the market. So it's $112 million, but 90 million of that 112 million is already spoken for. And who do you have to fight it for? You have to fight it for with banks like Mizan, Allied, Alphala, MCB, and many others who are much better capitalized, receive an enormous amount of support from the regulator. So when you look at the payment business as a business, while the numbers may look very, very attractive, the reality on the ground is a lot more depressing. So we've seen data, we've seen its use to quantify the size of a market, and we've seen what that quantification means for a business such as the payment business in Pakistan. What choices do we have as founders? In the technology business in Pakistan, as founders, we have four choices. We can choose between services or products. Services is easier, products is much more harder. And we can choose between customers, domestic customers or international customers. Just like services is easier, domestic customers are easier, international customers are harder. And the path that we often follow as founders starts with services, we move from domestic to international. Sometimes if you're lucky, we get a chance to take the work we've done internationally and turn that into a product first domestically and then internationally. The luckiest of us go from international services to international product. But this is where we all want to be. This is our holy grail. This is our holy grail because this is one of the most profitable segments. What's the distribution of technology companies in Pakistan if we filter them according to the grid that you see in front of you? 25% right? do domestic service, 50% do international service, 15% graduate to domestic product, and about 10% actually make it to international product. Very small proportion given the size of the technology industry in Pakistan. But this 10% is the most profitable of all segments in Pakistan. This is what we chase. This is what I've been chasing for the last 30 years. If you think about my own personal motivation, my own personal motivation, my story was very simple. I wanted to build a startup that do sell, exit, or generate enough revenues to make me worth $100 million. And then I take 10 of that $100 million and give it to the Fast Foundation so they could bring the Karachi campus all the way back from Bhais Colony to the city. So that Fast could recapture the splendor, the glamour, the stature of its foregone days. But it's been 30 years and I still haven't found my 100 million. Over the last seven years, I've been thinking about switching the lens, using a different lens to look at the same data. Let me give you an example. Let's start with 1.7%. Can you guess what this 1.7% represents? This 1.7% represents the 650,000 households we spoke about earlier. The 650,000 households we are all chasing. So if somehow we could build the best products, we could use the best technology, we could deliver the best possible value, we only touch 1.7% of all households in Pakistan. That's it. When you look back at your legacy, your legacy would have benefited less than 2% of the population in Pakistan. But it's not your fault. It's not your fault because the next number is 15.5%. And this 15.5% represents the 5.8 million households that are there in the urban household data set. The 5.8 million households only represent 15.5% of the roughly 38 to 40 million households that exist in Pakistan. So if somehow you could create a product, somehow if you could find a channel, somehow you could pick up a technology that would touch the entire household set that you worked with in the data set that I spoke about earlier, you touch 15% of Pakistani lives. That's it. And if you could serve and access and create value for everybody who has a bank account, you'd get to about a third of the population, about 32%. Clearly there's a story here. There is incredible value in changing the lives of the many versus a few. But you only touch, you can only help, you can only change the lives of the people you see. And the data sets that we work with, 
the markets that we focus on are limited at best to a third of a population. The remaining 68% we don't see. The remaining 68% we don't see because they don't make it into a data set. We talk about them, we make presentations about them, we fantasize about bringing the next billion under the technology net, but it's all transactional, it's all commercial. We're not interested in them, the quality of their lives or how we can improve them. We're only interested in our share of their very small wallets. And if they don't have a wallet, as far as we're concerned, they're invisible. None of us in the last 30 years, or me especially for that matter, has been able to see what lies on this side of the pie. Let me show you something that changed my life when I saw it for the first time. You see the slice? Part of our population, that is about 2.1%, spends less than $220 a year. Clearly less than a dollar a day. 98% of our urban population lives above this threshold. 2% lives under. 98% lives above this threshold. What is life-changing about this factoid is that in the 90s, this number was 57%. And despite all our challenges, despite the limitation of our resources, despite the politics, despite the restriction, despite the sanctions, despite the floods, despite the upheavals, somehow we've managed to bring it down to 2.1%. I think, I suspect, I may be completely wrong, part of this is technology. I suspect part of this is technology. Part of this is roads. Part of this is access. Part of this is education. Part of this is health. Part of this is planned. Part of this is unplanned. Someone, somewhere, within us, maybe people in this room, maybe people outside this room. When you put our collected efforts together, we did this. And my message today to all of you is somehow someone somewhere changed the equation. I don't know who it is. I don't know where they are, but they changed the equation. Today at Disrupt, when we sit down and think about opportunities that lie in front of us, when we think about paths that we want to walk on as founders, given a choice, pick paths that help you change the equation. If you can't raise capital, you don't have resources, write the checks you can with what you have. I teach freshman CS at IBA Karachi. My name is Jawad Hamid Farid. I also teach the tech product development course and the applied data analysis course. And I teach these courses because these are the checks I could write. My question to you, my friends, is what checks will you write today? Thank you.